Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Such an honor to be on the same panel, subhanAllah, with uh, our Shaykh Zain of Ansar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and preserve her and continue to elevate her rank and preserve her for us to benefit. So, subhanAllah, in addressing this particular topic, I've been tasked with addressing it from the perspective of the Ummahat al Mu'mineen, which, to be honest with you, makes me want to dance. <laughs> because I don't have the difficulty that, subhanAllah, our Shaykh Zain have had, but in addition, it's one of those things that actually really gets me excited. And it's, it gets me so excited is because when we talk about women in female scholarship, or we talk about women's vibrancy and dynamism inside the deen, it's not a new topic. For us, subhanAllah, it's actually something that's not, you know, something we're, we're just trying to embark on. It doesn't mean we're trying to take a modern twist to the deen. It doesn't mean any of that. In fact, it actually talking about the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen and the Sahaba, the female Sahabiyat who are around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we find that we, we find the deen so alive. We find such a dynamism. We find such diversity in terms of character and personality that it makes me excited because when we look at the definition of being a woman, there's no single narrow definition of being a woman and the proof of that we find that inside the wives of the Sahaba of the Prophet so for example we always hear who are the two women we always hear about the most Khadija and and Aisha right so we'll start with them because these two women are on two completely separate ends of the spectrum Right, when we look at Khadija radiallahu ta'ala an, she's an older, more established woman. First of all, she's, when she marries the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she's been married twice before. She actually has children when she's married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which by itself is a, is, is a game changer. In terms of us understanding our, in terms of us understanding our gender dynamics in our community, as well as some of the cultural baggage that we have that has no foundational practice or no foundational place inside of our deen, right? And so when she gets married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi we could just talk about those first, those first three things. Number one, she's a career woman. She's a businesswoman. That Subhanallah, this a lot of the business in, was initially inherited by her father that she then expanded. And so as she expanded that, again, it would be the equivalent if you see 18-wheeler trucks on the road right now, right? This, this was like what her caravans were like in terms of carrying out her goods. And so subhanAllah, as she would, you know, basically the CEO and the founder of this particular company, she even employed the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, But now, when we talk about how the Prophet وسلم, describes her, he talks about her as basically with all of these really beautiful feminine qualities qualities and one of them is that she never frowned at him she never said uh, she never said a mean word she never even raised her eyebrow to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam can you imagine that first of all can you imagine i'm just talking a woman in any position a woman who's been married twice before with kids gets has a full time career has also commercial real estate properties in addition to her regular career, gets married, has four more kids, right? And never frowns? Like, like, mashallah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. How the Prophet sallallahu said that every time he looked upon her, when he walked into her space, she would smile. She would greet him with pleasantries. I don't know about you, but I just want to be her. <laughs> that woman who just, no matter the circumstance, like, it's, it's positivity. Right? That is, I'm too blessed to be stressed. That is the definition of that. And so, subhanAllah, when we just look at her, and, and she's experienced, understand, she's experienced quite a number of hardship. It's not that she's living some, like, idyllic life that she's beyond, uh, you know, worldly experiences. She's not some paper cut of a woman. This is a full, seasoned, experienced woman who is going through all of these changes of life, subhanAllah, with its deep challenges. And one of the things is that even inside what she would use her wealth for, right? Because it's like, okay, she's this career woman, she's a family woman. She's also got like social justice on the side where she takes a number of her properties that are on the outskirts of Mecca. And when women come and complain to her about domestic violence or basically complaining about 
as you, as you are familiar with at that particular time, like girls would be buried alive. The second daughter child would be buried alive because it was considered a shame to the family or a shame to the husband to have this daughter, even though the sex of the child is on him. But that's a whole nother matter. And so the fact that when those women would come to her and complain, like, my daughter is in, is in, you know, is in, in danger of being buried alive, she would actually hide them out in some of her properties on the outskirts of Mecca in order to protect them. Like, subhanAllah, when we look at this type of woman, a career woman involved in social justice, also a mother who, mashallah, raises children who are committed to the deen, practicing the deen. As a matter of fact, her youngest daughter, right, becomes one of the most perfect women. Hey, so I don't, the most perfect woman of her time. Like this is this is how much she's in, involved in terms of her her uh, subhanallah, her motherhood. Even so much, subhanAllah, in the last days of her life, one particular day, she's in her home after the, after the boycott, after the three-year boycott, right? After the, the year of like, subhanAllah, they have been through the worst, almost the level of starvation. She no longer has the wealth that she used to have because she's given it all out in the cause of Allah. And as she's in her home, she's making food. The Prophet وسلم, is on his way home, right? And the angel Jibra'il in, is like intervenes, stops him as he's like in the path to going to his home and he says to him Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Khadija is preparing this specific type dish for you like she's she's ready she's getting ready to receive you but I need you to give her this message Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wants you to tell Khadija Radiallahu Ta'ala an, that Allah says salam to her Subhanallah can you imagine First of all, that Allah sends the angel Jibra'il to say, Salamu alaik ya Khadija, Salamu alaik ya Fatima, Salamu alaik ya Zainab. SubhanAllah. This is just, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just wanted her status to be known. Like, let it be known about not only how, how masha'Allah, how much of a boss woman she is, but how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves her. And that it's not so much these qualities, whether you're a career woman or you're involved with social justice or what, none of these things will determine, should not be a, a means of like crossing you off a certain list of righteousness. Right? It's actually how we respond to these things, how we allow these things to affect our character. This is what's at hand. Now we go to the other end of the spectrum. When we look at Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an, when she marries the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she's young, she's energetic, she asks a lot of questions, she's very studious, she ends, up being the, she ends up being the equivalent of a lawyer and a doctor in one. She actually reaches the status of what uh, of our Lady Zainab just mentioned, she reaches the status of what we would consider a mufti. During the Khalifa of, of Abu Bakr, during the Khalifa of her father, she's like basically considered a mufti. If you need, it, you need to understand issues of legal, uh, legal theology or sulu fiqh, you're going to go to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an. If you need a certain ruling in terms of uh, how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed this particular issue, you're going to go to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an. But now amazingly, she never had any children. She never had any children, and she was known for the fact that she could not cook, and she didn't know how to clean very well. Because subhanAllah, even in the case where, you know, the, the, in the case of the ifk, where her, you know, modesty was in question, where her character was in question, when the Prophet sallallahu began to inquire, he went to one particular companion of Rabi and asked, like, you know, uh, do you know anything, do you know anything bad about her that I should be aware of? Like, is this even possible in her character? And she says, La, wallahi ya Rasulullah, I don't know anything negative about her except that sometimes she oversleeps, and when she oversleeps, the goats come and eat from the bread. That's the most I know about, like, that's the worst that I know about her. I, this is the same wife of the Prophet وسلم, that one particular time she was having guests in her home and it was known by the other wives that she wasn't the best cook. And so another wife wanting to take some of the ajr and the blessing of course of serving the guests of the Prophet وسلم, as well as being concerned about let's represent the household of the Prophet وسلم, very well, they prepared some food and sent it over. 
right, to Aisha's home. And what did she do? Oh, no. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't just send some food to my house. Like, oh, you're going to shame me in my own house? Oh, no. And so when they went to serve the food and she saw it, right, she came out with her plate, the one that she had prepared, the plate that was on the ground, she flipped it over so harsh it broke the plate. She moved it out of the way and put down her dish. Hey, like, don't even worry about that. And the Prophet وسلم, smiled and said, your mother is jealous. Eat. Bismillah. Which says what? These are two very different personalities. Right? Very different women. Very different prototypes of women. And you know, as good as I do, most of you are closer to Aisha than you are to Khadija. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, the Prophet وسلم, said, Aisha is the meat to any dish. So there's hope for us. It's hope. Alhamdulillah. Now, these are women, Alhamdulillah, you're addressing women who are in social justice, women who are, you know, the issues of women who are interested in education, who are, you know, who are pursuing academia in this way. SubhanAllah, you have women who have been married, who have children. You have women who don't have children. You have, even when we look at how the Prophet وسلم, uh, begins to even build up the status of women in almost every niche of life, you find that just within the, the Ummuhat al-Mu'mineen, within the mothers of the believers. Now let's go to the woman who was actually married to the Prophet وسلم, before Aisha. Because this one for me is super exciting. Because it begins to address some of the issues that our sister Zainab, mashaAllah, Sheikh Zainab was addressing before me. He marries Solda. And when he marries Solda, Radi Allah ta'ala an, Solda is known as a dark-skinned Ethiopian woman. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that the Prophet of Allah, the Messenger of Allah, Khuluqul Adim, Habibullah Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, was married to a black woman. That should end all of the racial issues around beauty, around intercultural marriages, interracial marriages. Is it, is it inside of our deen? That should all end. That anti-blackness should end with the fact that our mother Solda married to the Prophet وسلم, after he was married to Khadija, and she is the one who actually continued to raise Fatima Zahra after her mother passed away. That the Prophet وسلم, became a, she also had six boys. Six boys. She had six children. The Prophet وسلم, became a stepfather to her six children. So all these issues that we have in our community, can we get remarried? Step parenting, is that allowed? Blah blah blah. That should just be squashed. All of these cultural misconceptions, issues we have, whether or not uh, married, women who've been married before are damaged goods or whatever other kind of cultural foolishness we have going on should end there. When we look at the issue next, when he marries Hafsa, which is the daughter of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala an, what I love about Hafsa, she's similar to the fact in Aisha that she's young, uh, she's also very studious, very firm upon her deen, very educated, never has children, different than Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an. Aisha was known to have a very, a, a very soft, sweet quality. Like she had fire, right? But she was also very, very sweet. Hafsa was not so much. Hafsa was known to be very direct. I mean, she's the daughter of Umar bin Khattab. Radiallahu ta'ala an. So you can pretty much gauge how that went. Right? In terms of you have some fathers, you just, you, it's just like this, right? But subhanAllah, when it came time to the beloved messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, when he was on his, when he was leaving us from this dunya, that he left the pages of the Quran with Hafsa. That she is the one, subhanAllah, that the beloved messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, left to preserve the most holy text. Our mother Hafsa, 
Subhanallah. Then if we go into, subhanAllah, there's Um Salama who's known that once there's a, and there's a competing narration, Allah Ta'ala Alam knows best, one with Um Salama, one with Aisha, actually more with Um Salama, where she asked the Prophet Sallallahu about gender equity in the Quran. She asked the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he mentions in the Quran, he says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, ya ayyuhal nas, ya mu'mineen. How come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it seems like he's only addressing men, right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam tries to reassure her, right? Tries to say to her, no, when Allah mentions ya ayyuhal nas, he's talking about everybody. He's talking about humanity, men and women. When he says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, he's talking about men and women. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses these different categories and mu'minun, he's talking about everyone. She wasn't satisfied. She wasn't. She felt like, no, I just, I, 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 I need to be addressed specifically. I need to know that I am directly included in this deen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew her heart wasn't satisfied. So he revealed Surah Al-Ahzab. Wan muslimina wan muslimat. Wan mu'minina wan mu'minat. Right? He, the, he, he revealed this surah to answer the question of a woman who's asking the messenger of Allah about Allah's gender language in the Quran. How should that change us about when our young daughters ask us questions about feminism or questions about gender or questions? That should be like a welcome question. It should be like, mashaAllah. You are asking as your mother asked you. You're asking as the best of women asked. And you have permission to ask. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala felt like you deserve to be answered. You deserve an answer. So he gave an answer that would last to the end of time in revealing these ayat of the Qur'an. This is huge. This is huge. It should not be something that we're telling our daughters, this is the deen, be quiet, you know, be, you know sit in the back, just submit, blah, blah, blah. It, it, no. Alhamdulillah, this is a welcome question. It's a real concern. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that there would be a 2021 and these would be some of the top issues of our time. We could, I'm going to end with this story because I think I'm well over my time. No, I'm going <laughs> to end with this story because I think I'm I'm going to end with one of my favorite stories. And it's about Um Amara Nusayba. So Um Amara, subhanAllah, at the time was a woman who uh, basically was taking care of the wounded soldiers. Like any time there was a battle, she'd have a tent. And in that tent, basically, she was helping to take care of those who were, you know, had received certain wounds to help stitch them up. Also to give water to those, to the soldiers, and to be a means of support, basically like a nurse. And so, subhanAllah, when in the Battle of Uhud, specifically, is that when the archers on the mount were giving the instruction to not move, right? They were told by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I, I, I want us to really hear this, this portion. They were told by the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, do not move no matter what happens until I give the instruction. Right? And so the Prophet وسلم, is standing, if you can imagine, on this at the bottom side of the mountain so he can see what's going on on the actual battlefield. He can see the archers on the mound and he has eye shot to be able to see the women who are in the tent to make sure they don't go unprotected. And so subhanAllah, the, basically because they're on the mound, they have the upper hand, the, basically the disbelievers begin to retreat. Right? And as they begin to retreat, the archers of the mound see, right? Like, alhamdulillah, like, basically, the, in, uh, when you at the, the edge of the sword, the hand part of the sword used to be made out of gold or sometimes silver. And so this was like very valuable. So when they were leaving their, the, what's considered, you know, leaving their weapons and there's gold and silver basically left strewn all over the battlefield. So then they began to descend. And someone called them and said, wait, wait. The Prophet of Allah, والسلام, told us not to descend, right, until, right, he gives the command. And so they begin to reinterpret what the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa meant. 
They begin to say, no, what he meant was, he meant for us not to move as long as the battle was going on. But now that the battle is over, we can go down. And so they begin to descend onto the battlefield. As a result, watching now that they've lost their higher position, right? they descend down, the disbelievers who are warring with them come around to this side and come up this side of the mountain. The Prophet وسلم, noticing they have descended, watches them go around, runs up the mountain to try to tell them come back, to call them back to their position. Now Um Amara Nusayba radiallahu ta'ala an is sitting at the base of the mountain. She can see the Prophet وسلم, going up this way. She can see the disbelievers coming this way. And she can see that the archers on the mound have left their position. What does she do? She runs from that tent. She runs up the mountain. And if you've been to the mountain of Uhud, and especially now, it's actually three times shorter than it was at that time. Right? So she runs up the mountain. She intercedes right in time between the disbelievers and the Prophet them. And she begins to defend the life of the Prophet ﷺ with her own military skills. The Prophet ﷺ said, when I looked to my right and I looked to my left, all I could see was the sword of Umm Amara. Subhanallah. She is the only one recorded in Islamic history that directly defended the life of the Prophet ﷺ single-handedly alone with her body. Subhanallah. She sustains over 12 stab wounds, 20 wounds in total. Before, subhanAllah, the archers on the mound then realize what they've done. They run back up the mountain, subhanAllah, to now defend her. Now the Prophet وسلم, the, and the, the Ansar at this particular time surround the Prophet وسلم, some this way and the outer circle facing this way. As soon as they make that formation, our mother Nusayba Umm Amara falls unconscious. They take her, subhanAllah, back to the tent. She remains unconscious for almost over a day. The Prophet ﷺ, when he wakes up, he's deeply wounded at this time because of their disobedience. When, subhanAllah, he's the, his chain metal is actually forced into his cheek, he's struck in the head uh, that cracked his, not only cracked his helmet, but cracked a portion of his skull. And then his last and final hit happened on his shoulder where he fell. And then they drug him off to the mountains. When the Prophet ﷺ woke up, the first thing he said is what happened with Umm Amara. I said, Ya Rasulullah, she hasn't woken up yet. He goes and he sits and makes dua by her bedside until she wakes up. And when she wakes up, he says, Ya Umm Amara, what do you want for defending my life? She said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to be in Jannah with you. He said, you have it. You have it. So we have a woman in almost every single position in society. We have female companions who were da'is, who went as far as Spain to spread the deen. We have those who were scholars. We have those who were, who were active in medicine, who were doctors. We have those who were businesswomen. We have almost every single, we have those who were stay-at-home moms who did not go outside of their home. We have every single aspect, different types of women, as there are different types of personalities in people. We find them in the example of the Ummahat and Mu'mineen and how to develop that personality in a way that is most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I, I tell us this story because subhanAllah, for there, I know there's some, I see these women out here in these Palestinian flags, they got some warrior women out here, right? Got some warrior women out here, see some sisters studying out Qalam, got some scholarly women out here, mashaAllah. We have examples inside of our deen. We have examples inside of our deen. But I want to remind us of this one particular, that small point that we must never forget. And that battle of Uhud, what they reinterpreted 
the words of the Prophet Alhamdulillah, Allah forgave them and that was known. And we should never say, if that was me, I would have been different. Nah, if that was us, we might not know what side we were on. <laughs> Honestly. Truthfully, we might not know. So as they, that reinterpretation, right? Like he didn't mean this, he meant it like this. He didn't mean this, he meant it like this. This is what we as women have to be careful of. That moment. So we can be those who have falls on adima. That's mentioned at the end of Surah Al-Azab. Those who were granted the highest level of success. Right? Because they understood who they were according to the definitions of Allah Azza wa Jal. And they lived and thrived in this deen as, with all that Allah has empowered them to be. To Jannah to Firdaus al-Ala. Jazakumullah. Afkhair. Assalamu alaikum.